Singer Four Star Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Ida Lupino, Charles Boyer in The Other Room. Material now, Rene. Fifteen years of research. Good. Fine, Martin. I don't want to sound conceited, but I think I've found a whole new approach to the subject of Voltaire and the tradition of skepticism in French life and politics. That's very interesting. When are you going to start to write the book? Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Will there be anything else, Monsieur Gargion? Uh, no, thank you. That's amazing. Only a week in New York. And you are already as well known here as in France. That waiter used to be at the Tour d'Argent. Oh, the Tour d'Argent. Remember, Rene? What? The day we passed our final exams. You and I and Marcel and the others. Why, we'd saved our money for months for that one dinner there to celebrate. That's right, and you made a speech. How we all looked up to you in those days. You were first in the class and I was let me see, the 28th. <laughs> what has happened to you? What do you mean? You're like a different man. You're not like the Martin Blanchard I used to know. When you walked in here this evening. You mean I've changed a lot. I know I have. You don't know what it's like to teach in a school like Vendover for 15 years. What boys that age can do to you. Why not leave that school then and write your book? You are a very successful man, René. It would mean so little to you. Only a trifling loan. If I could have just one year. You see, I've never had a chance to do what I wanted with my life. I've got to have it now. How can you say you've never had a chance? You were the most promising student in the whole of the university. Compared to you, I was nothing. I was ignored. No one believed that I would ever become famous. Well, perhaps it was a little easier for you. You had a wealthy family. It was no easier for me than for anyone else. I made my own opportunities and I wasn't afraid to take them. Life is the courage to seize the moment and no one can help you if you don't have that courage. Oh, I, I, oh, I didn't mean... Sorry. I'm sorry, Martin. It was wonderful seeing you again and remembering the old days. Yes, remembering. You don't think you could. No, Martin, I'm sorry. May I drop you anywhere? No, thank you. I've got to go back to that school. You'll be sure and send me a copy of your book. When you finish it, I'll do that. Thank you for the dinner. And for the advice. Hello? Yes? Yes, this is Martin Blanchard. Who? Roger? Webb. No, you don't know me, Mr. Blanchard. But I happened to meet a friend of yours this evening, Mr. René Campion, and he mentioned that you are working on a book on Voltaire. <laughs> no, Mr. Blanchard, I'm not a publisher. And I believe I might be of some assistance to you in helping to finance the writing of your book. Yes. Yes, I can be there. Tomorrow at six. The Savoy Hotel. Yes, thank you for calling. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Webb. Good night. Joan! Joan, dear. I have to be getting back to Roehampton, darling. Back to poor Ferguson. He's bedridden, you know. I don't like to leave him alone overnight. I'll be in tomorrow. We're expecting a visitor at six. What kind of a visitor? A Mr. Blanchard. Now, dear, the less you know, the less you'll have to worry about. Oh, Roger, please, won't you tell me what you're planning to do? You never tell me. 
Who is Mr. Blanchard? Who is he? Well, you might say he's a gentleman caller, a suitor for my little sister's hand. Good night, Joni. I can't think what's keeping Roger. He said he'd be here before six. Should I come back some other time? Oh, no. Please wait for him. Thank you. You said you were a teacher? Yes. I once wanted to be a teacher. Oh, years ago. But I couldn't leave my brother. His health never been very good, and he needed me. From my own experience, you've made a wise decision. You think I did? Yes. <laughs> Except it's funny, isn't it? I never really made any decision at all. That's very often true. I just went on doing what I'd been doing all my life, listening to Roger. You see, my parents died when I was a child, and my brother brought me up. He even chooses my clothes. Oh, I'm chattering. I'm sorry. Mr. Blanchard, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Not at all. I see you and my little sister have been getting acquainted. That's fine. I hoped you would. I brought some notes on my book. I thought you'd like to see what I've done. Oh, I would very much. Uh, Joni, would you excuse us a few minutes? Uh, Mr. Blanchard and I have some business to talk over. Yes. It was very pleasant meeting you, Mr. Blanchard. Oh, don't say goodbye. You two are going to see a lot of each other from now on, if everything goes well. I hope so. May I get you a drink? Oh, thank you. I suppose my phone call came as something of a surprise to you. <laughs> well, it did, but a very pleasant one. Good. I hope we can work out something together. To our mutual advantage. Won't you sit down? Thank you. You said on the phone last night that perhaps you could help me finance the writing of this book. Mr. Blanchard, I'm sure I can. Thank you. That's wonderful news. How much would you need? Eight thousand, ten thousand dollars? Oh, no, not that much. Let's say ten thousand. Mr. Blanchard, if you're going to make a whole new start in life, you'll need a little extra money. It's impossible to tell you how much this means to me. We're in a very fortunate position, you and I. We can help each other. How rare that is in this world. <laughs> how can I possibly help you? By starting a new life with ten thousand dollars. Anywhere you like, under any name that strikes your fancy, except Martin Blanchard. How would that help you, Mr. Webb? A little business transaction I'm contemplating. I need a man who is willing to disappear. I see. And perhaps you also need a man to steal or embezzle some money before he disappears. No, Mr. Blanchard. I would not require you to do anything of the kind. Or perhaps to take the blame for you. To act as your scapegoat, a decoy for the police. Nothing could be further from my intention. I may be a failure, Mr. Webb, but I'm not a fool. Now, Mr. Blanchard, will you please sit down and let's talk like sensible men? I'm not asking you to do anything except disappear. There'll be no blame attached to you and no police hunt after you. I can promise you that because legally you'll be dead. Dead? How are you planning to profit by my death? Your legal death. Now, you're a healthy man, aren't you? You can pass a doctor's examination. Well, yes. My dear Mr. Blanchard, have you any idea how much a healthy man is worth dead to his sorrowing widow? I'm not married, Mr. Webb. No. Neither is my sister, the young lady you met just now, Miss Joan. You want me to help you swindle some insurance company, is that it? What made you choose me? Just your good fortune, Mr. Blanchard, that you happen to be about the same height, the same age. Yes, you even have the same color eyes as a poor unfortunate friend of mine who's staying with me in the country. He's very sick. There's almost no chance of his lasting beyond this summer. But there isn't a company in the world that would insure him. He couldn't pass any doctor's examination. Thank you very much, Mr. Webb. It's been a most interesting talk, but I would prefer to find a less dramatic way of making a new life for myself. I wish you the best of luck. But opportunities don't grow by the side of the road. As Voltaire said, Mr. Blanchard, we must cultivate our own gardens to make them grow. That's very interesting. 
You're forgetting your notes, Mr. Blanchard. Or perhaps you don't think you'll ever have any use of them, after all. Thank you. Goodbye. Au revoir, Monsieur Blanchard. I'm not putting all the blame on you, Mr. Blanchard. Thank you, sir. But when two boys, Welch and Lorimer here, fail their entrance exams in the same subject, French, when it's either the catcher's fault or the pitcher's, isn't it? I'm sorry? And you're the pitcher, throwing knowledge at their young heads. Or perhaps you threw too many curves and they couldn't catch the ball. Am I making myself clear? Yes, sir. So I've had a talk with the boys' parents, and I've agreed to let Welch and Lorimer here stay on during the summer vacation and take special tuition in French from you, Mr. Blanchard. Here at the school? You'll be paid for your time on a monthly rate. But I was planning to go away this summer. I've made arrangements at a farmhouse. Have you made any arrangements about coming back here next term, Mr. Blanchard? And Mr. Blanchard, no curve. You're too inclined to try to fill the boys' heads with literature, Voltaire, stuff like that. Plain, basic French, that's what they need to pass examinations. Je tu a ila, Mr. Blanchard. Je tu a ila. I've had enough, Mr. Reeves. I can't go on, year after year. It's inhuman. I'm, I'm through. Mr. Webb, this is Martin Blanchard. But who is this man? The one you told me was dying. His name is Ferguson. He used to be my gardener. A poor, unfortunate man with no friends, no family to take him in, no one to care what happens to him or to claim his body when he dies. How can you be so sure this man will die? Oh, Mr. Blanchard, you mustn't think that of me for a moment. You may not regard my honor very highly, but I'm not a man to take a human life. Have you had a doctor for him? Yes, of course, but there isn't a doctor in the world that could help him. Poor Ferguson is sinking month by month. Does anyone know he's staying at your house? No one except the doctor and you and me, and my sister Joan. Very well. What do you want me to do first? Well, first we must welcome you into the family, Mr. Blanchard. It would be a marriage only in name that is understood. Naturally. May I say I respect you for saying so. And your sister Joan is willing to marry me? You leave Joanie to me. She won't even have to know what we're doing. I'll tell her that, uh, yes, that you and I are going into a business partnership and that for tax purposes, let's say, the company must be kept in the family. She would believe that? She'd believe what I tell her. My little sister has always been a docile child. I, I brought her up that way. To your new life, Mr. Blanchard. A new life? Hmm. Kitchen hooks, new light sockets, and this for your bedroom curtains. You bought the one I chose from the samples. Why, of course. Did you really like it the best, too? You have excellent taste. I'll start sewing them as soon as I've typed your chapter. Oh, the typing can wait until tomorrow. We have plenty of time. Oh, please come in. I saw you drive by coming back from the village. How are you, Joni? Aye, you did buy a lot of things, didn't you? Good. It's important to make the right impression on the local people. Happy, loving newlyweds furnishing their home. Well, I thought... Um, you didn't forget the lacquer, did you? The lacquer? Oh, no. No, I must have left it in the car. I'll get it. Curtains. Well, my little sister's turning into a regular homemaker. Please don't make fun of me, Roger. I'm delighted, Joni. When Mr. Blanchard and I terminate our business together, you can come and make a real home for me. Is Martin... Is Mr. Blanchard going away then? Yes, darling. As soon as the weather changes. First cold day. Yes, he's going away forever. Now, if you'll pardon us, Joni, we have a little business to discuss. Yes. I'll go on with your typing. Did everything go all right in the village? Yes, I suppose it went very well. 
Mr. Owen, the storekeeper, warned me himself that this lacquer was dangerous and not to leave it in the cellar after we start using the furnace. Let's take it down there now, then. Find a good place for it. A place where a man could forget he'd stored it. And then suddenly remembers it one day when the furnace is lighted, comes down here to get it and has uh, an unfortunate accident reaching it off that shelf over there. A terrible, fatal accident. Of course, it will have to take place within half an hour of Ferguson's dying, so the time of death will look all right to the coroner. But how do you intend to bring the body here and to stage the explosion without Joan knowing? I'll make sure that Joan is away from the house when the time comes, and you too. You mean you won't need me? I told you I don't require you to do anything except disappear. But what about Joan? Will she think that... She'll think that you're dead, just as everyone else will. Oh. And when do you expect it will be? And the poor fellow's sinking fast. I put him upstairs in the front room so he'll get the benefit of the sun. But I hardly expect him to last more than a month now. So soon? The sooner the better for you. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I was only thinking of the insurance company. They might be suspicious. I've only had the policy for a few weeks. That could work to our advantage, too. A man who was trying to cheat them would be likely to wait a little longer. What about the furnace? Well, we're coming toward the end of summer. Be having cold snaps before you know it, and uh, needing to light that furnace. Yes, I suppose so. Well, don't you worry about anything. I must be getting back to my patient now. He likes his supper early. What are you looking at? Nothing. That light in your brother's house. Where? The front room upstairs. Is that where poor Mr. Ferguson is? Yes, I believe so. It's getting cold in the evening. Shall I get your jacket? No. Martin, when Roger was here the other afternoon, he said you'd be going away soon. Would that matter to you? Take me with you. Please, I don't care where we go, but take me with you. Joan, I can't. It isn't that I don't want to, but it's impossible. Why? I can't tell you that. It's much better for you not to know. That's what Roger always tells me. It's better for me not to know. I'm sorry. Ever since I can remember, Roger's treated me like a child, his little sister. Do you know what it's like to be treated that way? You think of yourself as a child, a silly little girl. These last few months, you haven't made me feel that way. You've made me feel that I might be someone with a mind and a life and a dignity of my own. And I won't let anyone treat me like a child anymore. You've got to tell me what it is you and Roger are doing. I can't tell you. If I did, you would be an accessory. If something went wrong, they could send you to prison, too. To prison? Joan, you've got to trust me. Perhaps it isn't too late yet. Perhaps there is still some way for me to stop now. And you won't leave me? Joan. Every day when I wake up, I think it's one day closer to winter and you'll be going away and I... What do you mean? That's what Roger said. He said you'd have to leave as soon as the weather changes, the first cold day. When did he say this? When he was here that afternoon. He said the first cold day? Yes. How can he be so sure of that? I don't know. He, he seemed sure. He seemed sure because he knew. Knew what? I think your brother intends to kill that man. Roger couldn't do such a thing. I'm afraid he could. We've got to get that Ferguson out of your brother's house. Now, tonight. Martin, what is it? There is no time. Listen to me. I'll get the car. I'll drive towards the village. Wait five minutes and then call Roger.
What is it, Joni? What did you want to talk to me about? It's nothing, really. I suppose I'm just being silly. Oh, now, that's not possible. Martin and I had a quarrel. Hmm. And I was scared. I just wanted you to be here when he got back. Where did he go? Into the village. He's done it before, and sometimes when he gets back, he's... I'm sorry, I can't help being scared. No, that's all right. I'll always look after you, you know that. I'll stay right here until he comes back. Thank you. Hmm, getting cold. Time to light that furnace, get a little heat in the house. I know how it works. Oh, no, you stay right here. I can manage alone. Mr. Ferguson, are you there? Can you open the door? Mr. Ferguson, I want to help you. Good evening. My little sister tells me you had a quarrel. Joan, I think you'd better leave us alone. No, I won't go. I'm going to stay. Very well. I just went to your house, Mr. Webb. Well, I'm sorry I wasn't home. I managed to break open the door. Oh, I see. And also the door of the front room upstairs, where you've been keeping such a patient death watch over your poor friend. Mr. Ferguson, your poor friend who never existed. Yes, I'm afraid I haven't been quite frank with you about that. But I can't tell you how real that poor man seemed to me sometimes. I was to be the victim of a real accident down there in the cellar, wasn't I? Yes, Mr. Blanchard. That was my intention right from the beginning. Very good. So now we're quits. I am under no further obligation to you. It's nice of you to say that. Joni, it's time for you and me to be going home. No. I'm not going with you. I'm staying with Martin. Joni. No. You don't know what you're doing. You can't stay here now. You can't. And why not? What have you done? Martin, the furnace. Roger was just down there. No, Joni, no! <laughs> I cannot cry. I have no tears. I wish I could weep for you. This is no time for tears. Your whole life is ahead of you. A new life, Martin. <laughs> 